Good evening. Welcome everyone to our Wednesday night Bible study as we continue our study in the book of Revelation. Tonight we're going to be looking at chapter 3 verses 14 through 22. So please turn in your Bibles there and follow along with me as I read. Revelation 3, starting in verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things are the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you are a good, good Father. You are a good God, Lord. We love you. We thank you, Lord, that we can come into your presence, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we are your church the body of Jesus Christ. And as we gather together, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would take control. Lord, I pray as I offer you my five loaves and two fishes, Lord, I pray that you would multiply my offering, Lord, and feed your people. Feed them, Lord God, with what you want each and every one to have tonight. Let your words, Lord, come out of my mouth, Lord, in order that hearts will be changed and drawn to you. Lord, if there's anyone here tonight or listening online that does not know you as their Savior, I pray, Lord, that today would be their day of salvation. Have your way amongst us tonight, Lord. Be glorified in all that we say and do. As we do it in your name, Lord Jesus, and for your sake. Amen. Amen. Our letter starts off as all the others have. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, to the, to the messenger, to the pastor of the church of the Laodiceans. The church at Laodicea is the seventh and final church addressed by Jesus. Laodicea was located in the fertile Lycus Valley along with Colossae and Hierapolis. It was about 45 miles southeast of Philadelphia and about 100 miles east of Ephesus. The great Roman road stretching to the inland of Asia from the coast at Ephesus ran straight through Laodicea Center, making it an important center of trade. Laodicea was a great banking center and the wealthiest of the seven cities by far. It was so wealthy that the city was destroyed in the great earthquake of AD 17 and the people refused help from the Roman government to rebuild the city, choosing rather to do it entirely by themselves. 
this would be the equivalent of a U.S. city being hit with an event like a hurricane to jog recent memory and the president declaring a state of emergency for that area which opens up tremendous resources from the federal government and the mayor of that city saying, ah, it's all right, we got it. We got plenty of money. We don't need it. We got more than we need. That was the condition of Laodicea. Other sources of wealth besides banking came from a thriving wool industry. Laodicea was famous for a fine, glossy black wool that it produced. Laodicea also had a famous school of medicine that produced a special eye salve, famous for its cure of eye defects. Laodicea was not strong militarily, however. It was extremely vulnerable to hostilities due to its water supply. You see, Laodicea received their water via an aqueduct from six miles away in the direction of Hierapolis. This made them vulnerable to having their water supply cut off during a siege by an enemy. And this vulnerability may have led to Laodicea negotiating and compromising with any potential enemy. For history does not record any opposition to Laodicea, nor any persecution of the church there. There was another church that we know didn't have any persecution as well. And that was the other church that Jesus said absolutely nothing good to say about. The dead church. These things, our text says, says the amen. The faithful and true witness. The beginning of the creation of God. Jesus, as in the other seven letters, starts by identifying himself in a specific and special way that will be unique to the church in which he is speaking. He calls himself here the amen. We say amen at the end of our prayers. But do we think about what amen really means? It means so be it. Let it be done. Jesus is the so be it. We also, when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name. We say that phrase, in Jesus' name, amen. And these are words and phrases that we cannot allow ourselves to become so familiar with that they become trite and they lose their meaning. When we say in the name of Jesus, it's not just a, a, a tag-along phrase that we put at the end of a prayer. It means we're praying in the authority of Jesus, in the person of Jesus. We are saying this is what we are asking, Lord, and we're doing this in your authority, in your character, in who you are. And then we say, amen, so be it. Lord, as you will it to be, let it be. Jesus is the amen. He is the faithful and true witness. Jesus is the faithful one. We, we sometimes think that Jesus was God in the flesh. He didn't, he didn't need to have faith. But Jesus, we must remember, laid aside his glory. Although he never ceased to be God, not for one second, he laid aside the privileges of of being God when he emptied himself and he completely relied on being led by the Holy Spirit and being directed by the Father. The Bible tells us that he didn't do anything except what the Father told him to do. He is the faithful one and the true witness. The word for witness in Greek is martis. It's where we get our word martyr. That is a true witness. A true witness is one who witnesses with his life. And that's what Jesus did. He was the true witness because he gave his life. The question is for us, 
How true is our witness? How true is my witness? Have we laid our lives on the line? As Romans 12, 1 commands us to do so. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It is only reasonable for we to give Jesus our all, to lay our lives on the altar. Have we presented ourselves completely and wholly to Jesus? Verse 15 says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Jesus knows the works of the church of Laodicea. Jesus knows the works of all of his churches. Jesus knows the work of this church. He tells them, you're neither hot nor cold. Jesus is making reference and he's comparing the state of the Laodicean church with the city's water supply. I mentioned earlier that Laodicea received their water from the direction of Hierapolis via aqueduct. Hierapolis was famous for hot springs. These hot springs were believed to have healing properties and people would come from all over to just lay in these hot springs to receive their healing benefits. Some say the water had a high sulfur content, which made it smell and taste bad. By the time that water arrived to Laodicea through an aqueduct six miles away, it was lukewarm and unpalatable. Laodicea's other neighbor, Colossae, had cold water refreshing water that came from snow and rain-fed streams that rushed down from the peak of nearby Mount Cadmus. So they had hot springs on one side and cold, refreshing water on the other side. And that's what Jesus is referring to. He said, I wish you were hot. Hot is good. I wish you were cold. Cold is good. But you're lukewarm. Neither good. Nauseatingly lukewarm. Jesus is telling this church, you make me sick. So sick, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. We need to examine ourselves. I need to examine myself. The Lord called me to be an example to you. That was my specific call. And as I examine myself, I need to confess to you that I was more on fire for Jesus when I first got saved than I am right now. And for that, I repent. I am definitely more mature in the Lord, far more wise in the Lord. But maturity and wisdom cannot make up for lack of fire for the Lord. See, I remember when I first was saved, I was almost physically sick for the passion that I felt for each person's soul that I spoke to. When is this conversation going to turn? How can I tell them about my Jesus? So I repent before you and the Lord because that passion has faded. I don't want to make my Lord Jesus sick. I don't want him to vomit me up. The Lord has shown me the alternative. If we don't want to make the Lord vomit, we will inevitably make others vomit. That's the alternative. The question is, are you willing? Or is the praise and adoration of people of this world more important to you than what Jesus thinks about you and how valuable that soul is to him. 
when we boldly proclaim Jesus the way he has called us to, people will hate you. They will be sick of you. They may tell you to your face, you make me want to vomit because they don't want to hear it again and again. They don't want to know what you stand for. Because once they know what you stand for, you don't even have to say anything else. Just your presence is going to make them sick. John chapter 15, verses 18 through 19 says this. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Beloved, we can't care that the world hates us. We, 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 is, this isn't a popularity contest. We are in this for the souls of men and we, for our own family that don't want to invite you to the family functions anymore because you're all about telling them about Jesus and they don't want to hear it. You know, that's okay for you. I'm, I'm glad that works for you. You know, no, no, you don't understand. There's a heaven and there's a hell. There's an eternity, and I want you to be with me there because if you're not there, the alternative is unfathomable for you. They don't want to hear it, but we are obligated to not only speak it, we are obligated to live it. Now, I'm not saying be obnoxious. I'm not saying be unwise. We are to be, according to Matthew 10, 16, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But we are to be bold. We must sow a seed when it's time to sow a seed. We must speak truth to error when it's time to speak the truth to error. But we need to constantly be sensitive and following the leading and the direction of God the Holy Spirit at all costs. Verse 17, because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, the Laodicean church sees themselves, they're saying this of themselves, that they're rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And by all outward appearances, they were. The problem is it's outward appearances. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Look how Jesus describes the believers in Laodicea. He says, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. These believers are living in a city that is abundantly wealthy, and they have participated in that wealth. But Jesus says, you are poor. They live in a city that is famous for its fancy, shiny black wool, Phrygian wool. Yet Jesus says, you are naked. They live in a city famous for eye salve. People come from all over to buy this eye salve. Yet Jesus says, you are blind. Beloved, we need to understand the difference between what this world calls success and what Jesus calls success. Micah chapter 6 verse 8 says, he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? We should never say of ourselves, I have become wealthy. I am rich. 
All we have is what Jesus gives us. We are products only of his grace. And we need to humble ourselves before him. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38 says, When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy hand. We cannot be ashamed of Jesus in this sinful and adulterous world. That is living a lukewarm life. We need to be bold and stand strong for Jesus, in Jesus. This is who I am. I am a Christian. I am a Christ one. I identify with the Lord Jesus God Almighty. I'm sorry. I'm not down with what you say is popular. I'm not down with what you say is acceptable. I'm only down with the truth. And his name is Jesus. We need to lose ourselves in Jesus. To lose yourself in Jesus is to be hot or to be cold. It's to be refreshed by that cold drink or to be warmed by that hot spring. It's not to be nauseatingly lukewarm. What is the solution? Verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich notice the words Jesus says buy from me Jesus wants us to know that it's going to cost us something we need to buy from Jesus salvation is free Jesus has paid the price it cost us nothing. It cost him everything. But sanctification costs everything. We need to be willing to surrender ourselves completely and wholly to the Lord. We are to pay the price for gold that is refined in the fire. Gold is a beautiful and costly metal that represents wealth. And fire makes that gold pure gold. It's the fire that, that brings the impurities to the surface so the dross can be wiped off and it can be pure, beautiful gold. Jesus wants us to possess that. The true riches. Riches that are from him alone, not from this world. We need to be willing to go through the fire of trials just like fire purifies the goal the fire of trials purifies the Christian a lukewarm Christian doesn't want to go through fiery trials a lukewarm Christian thinks that everything should always be just fine coasting through life but that is not the life that Jesus has called us to the Bible tells us that all who would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus says we need to buy from him also white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. We learned in our study of Ephesians 4.24 that we are to put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. 
We are to buy from Jesus white garments. Again, buying symbolized that it costs us something to possess what Jesus wants us to have. It costs us to put off the old man and put on the new man. We have to die to our flesh. We have to die to our old desires. You see, that old man, he wants to bicker and argue. The old man wants to hold on to petty offenses. The old man doesn't want to humble himself to another brother and say, I was wrong. We need to pay the cost of putting off the old man and putting on the white garments that Jesus wants us to have. He goes on. He says, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. He wants us to buy eye salve from him. You see, we can't be satisfied with the world's eye salve because using the world's eye salve leaves us blind. And we're more blind than ever if we're trusting in what the world has to offer us. We need to buy eye salve from Jesus so we can see. Psalms 119 verse 18 says, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Jesus said of Paul in Acts chapter 26, verse 17 and 18, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Elisha prayed for his servant in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 17. He said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. My prayer is that we would have the eye salve of Jesus so our eyes will be open. So that we can see in the spirit the things that God wants us to see. The needs that people have. The pain that goes behind people saying, oh, I'm okay. I'm good. We need to be able to see it in the spirit so we can labor in the spirit according to the will of God. Verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Jesus had absolutely no good thing to say about this church. Not one thing. There was no commendation he had for the church at Laodicea. Yet he still declares his love for them. The Bible tells us that God is unwilling that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus loves them in their lukewarm state where they make him want to vomit them up. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. If you are being chastened and rebuked by the Lord, it's not because he has something against you. It's because he loves you and he wants you back. He wants you to be zealous and repent. What does it mean to repent? Repent means to do a 180. You're walking away from Jesus. You're walking in sin. You're following your flesh. You're doing what the enemy wants you to do. You need to do a 180 and turn back to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I want to do your will. That's what repentance means. 
Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus is standing at the door. This is a call for repentance and renewal for the saints of God. This isn't for unbelievers. This is for saints. Jesus said, I'm standing at the door. I'm knocking. Will you let me in or will you continue to shun me? Will you continue to grieve the Holy Spirit and quench the Holy Spirit? You have not allowed me free reign in your life. You have not allowed me to work my work in your life and to bless you with the blessings I want to bless you with. I'm standing at the door and knocking. If you open the door, I'm going to come in and dine with you. Dining with someone was a measure of intimate fellowship back then. If you broke bread with someone, that was fellowship. We know what that's like. You know, we're Christians, man. We can't have fellowship with our food. You know, every time we get together, there has to be food. You know, you, we're in San Antonio, so at least chips and salsa, right? I, I call them fellow chips. Right. <laughs> Jesus wants to dine with us. He wants to have intimate fellowship with us. He says, I will come in and, and, and be with you. I will be in you. I will dine with you and you with me. Verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He is talking to this church that is lukewarm. And he's saying, you can go from where you are so far from me to sitting with me on my throne. All it takes is for you to be zealous and repent. That all it takes is a change of heart. No one is so far away from Jesus that they can't simply turn around and say, Lord, forgive me. He is waiting in order to forgive. Jesus loves with an everlasting love. No one is outside of his grace. It simply is a matter of humbling ourselves and turning to him. The benefits of being an overcomer in Jesus is absolutely unfathomable. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Because sometimes life gets hard, right? Does life get hard sometimes? It gets hard. You know, we're believers and we get tried. You know, we're out there, we're in the world, we're not of the world, and life is difficult. But the Bible tells us that we need to set our affection above where Jesus is. Sometimes we need to just take a break and relieve ourselves from this world and think about our inheritance because that's all that matters. We know that the Bible says, what is your life? It's just a vapor that appears and then it's gone, right? I give this example all the time. You take that hot skillet, drop some water on it, pssst, and you see that little vapor and it's That is our life compared to eternity. And God has so much for us in eternity. And right here, this is where we earn those crowns. This is where we earn those rewards for being faithful to him. That we will enjoy those rewards for throughout all eternity. Jesus says, he that is faithful with a little, I will make you ruler over much. 
We need to remember what we are living our lives for. Don't accumulate treasures here, the Bible tells us, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves can break in and steal, but store your treasures up in heaven. Don't live for the vapor. Live for the long haul, eternity. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. As always, the message here is for all who has an ear to hear. Jesus is speaking to you. And it is absolutely amazing how the Holy Spirit fashions the message exactly to what you need. Although everyone is hearing the same thing coming out of my mouth, God the Holy Spirit tailors it just for you. What God does not want is an emotional response that causes you to leave here feeling one way or another, and then tomorrow there is no change. The Holy Spirit is conforming us each and every day into the image of Jesus Christ as we surrender ourselves to him, as we leave it all on the altar. I know that God has spoken to me through his word, and I cannot be the same. Change has happened in my life, and I pray the same is true for you. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this timely word in Revelation about this church of Laodicea, this lukewarm church that had no good in them, Lord, such that you needed to vomit them out. They were so disgusting. And Lord, I pray that we are not that church and will never be that church. We live in a country, Lord God, that is filled with lukewarm churches. We live, Lord God, in a time where being lukewarm is the status quo. But we can choose not to be, Lord. So I pray, Lord, for fire in the heart of every believer here tonight, everyone listening online, that we, Lord, would be zealous, that we would repent, Lord God, and we would just surrender all that we have to you to do your will, Lord God, to give all that we have for you every second of every day. Why? Because you are worthy, Lord. You paid the price for us. Lord, if there's any here tonight that does not know you're a Savior, any listening online that does not know you're a Savior, I give them the opportunity now. If you're listening and you need to receive Jesus as your Savior, it's as simple as just opening up your heart and say, Lord, I surrender. Take over. I surrender my life to you. Be my Lord. And my Savior, and he will come into your heart and change you. You will be born again. Gracious God, we love you so much. We thank you for all that you are to us, Lord God. We ask that you would continually bless us, heal us, equip us to do your work, Lord. Just give us what we need to do your will. And we ask it all in your name, Lord Jesus, for your sake. Amen. God bless you all, and hope to see you on Sunday as we continue our study in Ephesians. Good night.